Okay, can we have the first slide up? So um, I, at this point, it would be my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Ruth Murray-Webster. Um, Ruth is the director of a company called Lucidus Consulting, and uh, she's also a visiting fellow at Cranfield University in the UK. She's an organization change consultant, um, and she's just doing a doctorate, a DBA, a doctorate in business administration in organizational change. And uh, I've known Ruth for, uh, I guess, about 10 years. We've worked very closely together, um, and we've written uh, a few books together, three books in the area of risk psychology, um, where she comes as the people person, the sort of the change management organizational person. She's a, a specialist in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and a number of other sort of psychology areas. And then I brought risk expertise, and we learned from each other and developed some quite interesting insights. Um, and Ruth and I have written a book together, um, which is called A Short Guide to Risk Appetite. Now, risk appetite is one of those things where you have to decide how much risk you're going to take. And if you look around the room, see if you can see Ruth. Well, you can't, because she's not here. And she took just a little bit too much risk in trying to arrange her travel plans, and she's currently stranded in Zurich. Um, and uh, her plane from the UK, from Manchester to Zurich, where she was changing, was delayed, and then she missed the connection, and the next connection is at 5 p.m., and so she's not able to join us today. Now, one of the roles of the chairman is that if any of the speakers drop out, then I have to give their presentation for them. So I'm very pleased that it was Ruth who dropped out, um, because then I can give her presentation, because I do actually know what she was going to talk about. Um, so I'm really disappointed that you don't have a chance to hear Ruth. She's a great speaker. She really knows her material, um, and uh, she would have been much better at this than I am. Um, she's very kind to say that the ideas in her presentation are jointly developed with me, and we've written the book together, which is coming out uh, in about two weeks' time. So you're not going to get Ruth, but instead you're going to get me. And uh, you can leave now if you like, um, but uh, if you don't want to leave, then I'm going to give you my take on Ruth's topic. Uh, and so I'm going to start with this slide, which says that uh, these ideas were developed with Ruth. And so we, uh, we respect and honor one another. Um, and uh, it's, a joint, uh, it's a joint offering. So let's uh, talk about this subject of risk appetite, because we all know that risk is important. We have to take risks. And there's a number of different ways in which we might think about that. The question is, how much risk? How much risk? It's a very important question for us to answer in lots of different settings. And we could answer that how, much Chris, that how much risk question, or we could complete it in a number of different ways. For example, how much risk do we face? What's the risk exposure in front of us? And how much risk actually can we take as an organization or as a project, or maybe as an individual? There's another question, which is, how much risk should we take? And another question, which would be, how much risk do we want to take? There's another question, how much risk are we actually going to take? And finally, how much risk are we taking now? And one of these is risk appetite. But which one? There's, they're all important questions, and we need to know the answers to all of those questions. Our current risk exposure our target risk exposure, our risk capacity, our risk tolerance, our risk threshold, our risk propensity. Oh dear, lots of different words. And the idea of risk appetite is to answer one of these questions. Now all of the other questions need to be answered as well. And part of the problem with risk appetite is that there's a lot of confusion about the words, about the terms. Do we know what risk appetite actually means? And of course, if not sure what the word means, what the phrase is really about, then how can we answer the right questions? And maybe we're trying to answer one of these questions using the wrong concept or the wrong idea. So what I want to do in this talk is to introduce uh, a, a grassroots, ground-up understanding of what risk appetite means, why it's important, and how we can understand it and express it. Now, appetite is an ordinary word, and we get risk appetite from the word appetite. And we can learn a lot about risk appetite by thinking about our natural appetites. So why don't we start there? What is appetite? Appetite is the desire to satisfy a need for something. And there's an internal driver. You feel hungry for something. I've said food or drink. 
I'm British, so we don't really talk about sex, but you know, you might have a sex drive as well, and there's an appetite, and there's appetite for fame, there's an appetite for danger, there's an appetite for all sorts of different things. And appetite expresses the desire to satisfy that need. We're going to send everybody to sleep, I think, are we? Is that the, is that the idea? I have a real challenge to keep you awake now. Um, now, the question we might usually ask if we're thinking about food is this question, how hungry are you? And maybe how hungry are you is a way of understanding the level of somebody's appetite. But the important thing to recognize is that hunger is not appetite. Because if we ask the question, what is your appetite for food, how do you express that? What units do you use? What are the units of appetite? Is it low, medium, high? Is it one, two, three, four, five? Is it very or not very? We don't have a language to express risk appetite, or to express appetite. But we use hunger as a proxy, as a stand-in for appetite. So then we can express hunger using measures, using units, which stand in for the units of appetite. So when we're talking about appetite, we need some stand-in or proxy outside measure, which we can use to give us a view of what the appetite is, because we have no language for appetite itself. I hope that makes sense. So um, we ask the question, how hungry are you? And in England, we might say, well, I could eat a horse. Of course, you can't really eat a horse. It's just a way of expressing your appetite. It's saying, I'm very, very hungry, and so I want the big meal of a whole horse. Uh, well, you know, you can measure a horse. You can have a little pony or a very big shire horse, and that horse is a measure of this internal desire for food. But the horse is not the appetite. And the hunger is not the appetite. The appetite is something hidden inside. So let's just answer a few more questions about the features or the characteristics of physical appetite for food or for drink or for other things. The first thing is that the appetite is the desire. It's the expressed need. It's I've got something in here which is missing, which I want to fill. And it meets a need which might be conscious or unconscious. I might not realize that I need water, but I have that thirst. I might not realize that I need salt, but I add it to my food. It's sometimes an unconscious thing. Um, it's inside, and therefore it's not measurable. And that's a really important thing, which means that appetite is not food. Okay? We satisfy our appetite with food, but appetite is not food. So we need some sort of external measure for appetite, and we use food as a measure for how hungry we are. Okay? So our appetite does affect the way that we behave. It affects the, the amount that we eat. It, amounts, it, it affects when we eat. It affects how we eat, quickly or slowly. And there are a whole range of different factors that influence our physical appetite. Now, I think we could probably agree on all of these things when we think about hunger and this sort of internal thing that says, do I want a big meal or a small meal? And what drives that? What about risk appetite? We could actually take each one of these characteristics and use them to show us something about this thing called risk appetite. So first of all, physical appetite is a desire for something. Risk appetite is a desire for risk. How much risk do we want to take? That's the thing we're trying to express. And it's meeting some sort of need to take risk, which might be strategic or corporate. It might be project-based. It might be personal. It might be psychological. It might be hidden or it might be open. And the risk appetite is meeting that need that either I or my project or my organization have to take risk. Just like physical appetite is an internal driver and you can't see it, which means you can't measure it, so is risk appetite, something which is internal, a characteristic of a person or of an organization or of a group, and risk appetite is not an amount of risk. Okay, we satisfy risk appetite with an amount of risk, but just like appetite is not food, so risk appetite is not risk. Okay, you with me so far? And like we need some external thing to measure our physical appetite, we need some external thing to measure our risk appetite. And like we use an amount of food to measure or express our physical appetite, we can use an amount of risk to express our risk appetite. And we would call this risk thresholds or maybe risk tolerance. 
But the amount of risk is not the risk appetite, it's the expression of the risk appetite. It matters because, just like physical appetite affects our behavior, how much we eat, and so on, <laughs> risk appetite also affects our behavior. It affects the decisions we make. It affects the amount of risk that we take and how we respond to it. It affects our whole risk-taking behavior. And just like physical appetite is influenced by lots of things, so is risk appetite. So it's a very close parallel, and we can learn quite a lot about risk appetite by thinking about something that we already know about, physical appetite. So those are the basic principles that I think we need to, to think about. Why does this matter? Why are people talking about risk appetite? Well, I think there are two main reasons. One is that we find it in the standards. We've talked a little bit about ISO 31000 and other standards. We find it in the regulations, in uh, COSO, or in the King 3 in South Africa, or the Australian Stock Exchange. All of these corporate governance requirements tell us that boards must understand and express their risk appetite. Or we find it from the professional bodies. There's a whole host of different professional bodies here, the Institute of Risk Management, the Institute of Operational Risk, the Business Continuity Institute, and so on. They're all saying we need to do something about this. So if we want to comply with the standards, and if we want to meet the corporate governance requirements, and if we want to, do, to take the advice of the risk professional bodies, we need to understand and express our risk appetite. The problem is most of these bodies including the ISO standard, don't actually tell you what it is. They just tell you that we need to understand and express it. And the few that do tell you what it is disagree with each other. So we have a problem. We've got to do it because we have to comply. Well, that's not a very good reason to do things. Compliance is not a good reason. But actually, there's another much better reason for understanding and expressing risk appetite. And that's because it's important for decision makers. Pretty much every decision we make is related to this question, how much risk? How much risk are we facing? How much risk can we take? How much risk do we want to take? How much risk will we take? How much risk are we now taking? We need to know the answers to all of those questions. Will they be the setting of corporate goals, investment decisions, strategy, pro portfolios and projects? All of these things, we have to know the answer to the how much risk question. And we have to be very careful not to be like Snoopy, to make lots of decisions, and great, I've made good decisions, ah, I've made bad decisions. We don't just want to make any decision, we have to make the right decisions. And that's the real challenge for decision makers. So Ruth thinks, and I think, and I agree with her, that risk appetite is important because it helps us answer all of these questions. That actually there's a whole set of important questions, and risk appetite determines how we answer the questions. So we need to know what it is. And we also need to know what it is not, so we don't get confused. Now, there's lots of different ways we can apply this. We could apply this personally. You know, when I bring up my children, I have to manage risk, threats and opportunities, and I have an appetite for risk with the way that I bring up my children. When I plan my career and I think about a professional development, I have an appetite for uncertainty and how much am I allowed, uh, am I prepared to take? Do I want to give up a secure job and take on something different because it gives me some opportunity or would I rather play it safe? Investing for my pension, managing my project, driving my business. We have to answer all of these questions and there are multiple levels of risk appetite. So there are individual risk appetites and group risk appetites in project teams and corporate risk appetites in management boards and societal risk appetites in nations. And all of these things should be consistent and coherent and aligned if we're going to perform effectively and to our peak, uh, peak um, performance. So it's really important. But what is it? We still haven't actually got a definition of what risk appetite is. It's a hot topic, but not everybody agrees. In fact, nobody agrees on really what, how we might describe it. There's no single definition and lots of overlap and confusion with all of these other risk-related terms. So I think we could draw an analogy, a picture, a parallel with physical appetite and produce a definition of risk appetite like this. Risk appetite is an internal tendency to take risk in a given situation. Okay, so it's a situational thing. 
It's different in different situations. It's internal, so it's a driver that we can't see that we need to express externally in some way. And it's about taking risk. How much risk should we take? Okay, so we're going to use that as our kind of working definition uh, for the rest of this uh, presentation. Now, um, I want to just get a little bit more complicated or complex, perhaps, and uh, just give you a little bit of detail around how some of these other uh, risk-related terms fit with the risk appetite uh, concept. And what I'm going to do now, having started with hopefully a clear definition of risk appetite, I want to go outwards into lots of detail. Some of you, it might be too much detail. Some of you might be saying, let's get into something you know, that we can get our hands on. So some of you like detail and some of you don't. I'm going to give you some detail. If it doesn't work for you, just uh, be patient for five minutes and we'll come out of the detail and back into the high level uh, towards the end. But let's think about where risk appetite comes from, what influences and drives it, and then what does it produce? What are its outcomes? So I said in the definition that risk appetite is a tendency to take risk in a given situation. So clearly, one of the inputs to risk appetite is the situation. And not just the situation that we face, but the objectives that we choose within that situation. So we might have a number of different companies that compete, which all face the same external situation, the same competitive landscape, the same strategic drivers, and they choose different objectives. And uh, in the session in uh, the other room through here, uh, Igor was talking to us about whether we might choose you know, a, a, an aggressive investment strategy, a kind of a business-as-usual strategy, or a cash cow, milk it, and, uh, and then get out strategy. And each one of those would be different objectives in the same situation. And depending on what our objectives are, it will influence how much risk we want to take. Right? So if we're going to go aggressive, then we might want to take a lot more risk and then manage it very carefully. If we want to just milk the situation and get as much out of it as we can and then move on, we might not want to be so worried about risk and just, just take advantage of it. So clearly the situation is a, a key driver. But individuals make decisions. Decisions aren't made by processes or by organizations, and individuals will have some kind of risk preference or risk propensity. And Jeff would have been talking to you. He calls this risk type. But those of you who were on this side uh, during the morning will have heard Jeff Tricky talking about risk type. And risk type is his word for what we call risk pref preferences and propensity. Risk preferences are the anchor, if you remember this picture with the boat, uh, the, the thing which is our sort of inherent desire to take risk. And then our propensity is how we express that. That's the boat floating on the surface depending on the waves and the wind. I hope he showed you that picture. He should have done. Um, so so the, the individuals who make up the decision-making group will bring some kind of risk type or risk preference with them, and that's going to influence the amount of risk that they're prepared to take, right? But so does the group that they're part of, and there will be some kind of corporate risk culture which sets the environment or the context for making risky decisions. And we've heard quite a bit about risk culture uh, during the day today, and I think we'll hear more about it tomorrow. So the kind of context of the organization and how much risk the organization is prepared to take also influences how much risk we'll take in a given situation. So those are our inputs, the individuals, the group, and the situation that we face with the objectives that we've chosen. Um, and then in terms of the output, what we're seeing from risk appetite or what we need to see is some kind of physical, visible, measurable expression that we can get our hands on. And this is what we're calling risk thresholds. This is like the amount of food. This is the amount of risk that we're prepared to take driven by our risk appetite. Okay, so risk thresholds are expressed in the same terms as objectives. They are plus or minus tolerances around each of our key objectives. And they are expressions of uncertainty. They are an amount of risk which gives us a, a, a measurable view of this internal driver that we call appetite. All right, so appetite comes from the situation we face, the individuals we have, and the corporate culture, and it results in risk thresholds. And then we use those risk thresholds to drive our um, decisions. Now, is there anything wrong with this? 
I think there's a potential problem in this kind of setup with risk appetites being driven by the individuals and the group and the situation they face and then trying to produce risk thresholds out of that. And the problem is with these things here, people. Because risk propensity and risk preference and corporate risk culture are also invisible. So how can you see what my risk preference is? You can't. Sometimes I don't even know myself. How do we describe in a, 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 an understandable way the risk culture of the organization? Do we have a, a common language for that? Actually, we don't. So the problem we have here is that we want to get something measurable outside that we can use, that we can actually say against this objective, maybe it's share, share price, maybe it's return on investment, maybe it's project delivery date, or maybe it's margin or profitability. We've got some margin of uncertainty that's our risk threshold, which expresses our risk appetite, but everything that produces that, apart from the situation, everything that drives it is hidden and internal and unmeasurable. So then, how do we influence this? So the risk threshold is really important, but everything that leads to it we can't get our hands on, we can't influence it, because we can't see it and we can't measure it. So where can we influence any, exercise any kind of influence? Nowhere in this diagram, apart from changing the situation or changing the objectives and doing something else. What if we really want to do that? How can we be sure that we're setting appropriate risk thresholds? Risk appetite is one of those things that just is. It's, it, it is what it is. It comes out of who I am and who our organization is, and I can't influence it. And it produces a set of risk thresholds that just are. And the problem is that those thresholds might be wrong. They might be inappropriate, leading me and my project and my organization to take too much risk or too little risk. And how do I know? And that's the real problem with risk appetite because I don't know whether I'm taking too much risk or too little risk. Let me give you a, a quick example of how this works in practice. Um, about uh, three or four months ago, um, I went to Australia, and I was there to do some work, and I flew in from the UK. It's 22 hours of flying time. You stop for a couple of hours in the middle. Um, and I was met at uh, the airport by my host, uh, who is somebody that I, I know. He took me for lunch. And then in the afternoon, that same afternoon, we were going to run a workshop together. Stupid planning, I know, but that's how it worked out. And so we went to this really nice restaurant. And here it is uh, on the waterfront at a place called Bar One Heads. Um, and it's a fantastic fish restaurant. And I really like fish. And he said, well, welcome to Australia. Here's the menu. You can have anything you like. Now, I looked at the menu, and my mouth started to water. And I saw these, this salt and pepper, is it on there? Salt and pepper calamari. And I saw a fresh sea bream. And I saw, and he said, oh, and the wine list, you know, we're in Australia, fantastic wine list. And I saw this Sancerre, and I saw a really nice Chablis. And I thought, yes, I, I could really have a nice meal here. I could have a, a great starter. I could have whole fish straight out of the sea, nicely, lightly grilled, and, uh, and a nice little dessert and a half a bottle of wine. Fantastic. That was my hunger expressing itself. If I had done that, I'd just flown for 22 hours, just landed, eaten a big meal, drunk half a bottle of wine, then I go to my, to, my, to my workshop. And how would it have been? It would have been a disaster. So I had to moderate my appetite. I had to think about the situation and think about my objectives and think about how much risk I was prepared to take. So I did have the salt and pepper calamari, and then I had a salad, and I had some sparkling water. What a shame. What a waste to go to a lovely place like that. I, of course, did go back later. But then um, I went and I did my workshop, and it was a great, successful workshop, and been invited back several times since, and they were all very happy. So what happened was that my simple appetite led me, would have led me, to an unwise decision. I had to put something else in. I had to think about where my appetite led me unmanaged, then decide if that was a good place to be, is that going to help me achieve my objectives or not, and if not, I need to do something else. I need to exert some judgment and some control. 
But where in that risk appetite flow can I do that? I am who I am. The corporate culture is what it is. The situation is what it is. So my risk appetite leads me to this. And if I don't intervene, I'll just produce some risk thresholds that might be right or they might not. So I need to do something else. The first thing I need to do is to check whether the amount of risk that I feel I could take is right. Can I actually cope with that amount of risk? And this is what we call risk capacity. If I did that, would the organization go bust? Would the project break all of its boundaries and constraints? Would I, as an individual, fall asleep with half a bottle of wine? And if the answer is that the amount of risk I'm driven to take exceeds my capacity, then I can't take it. Then I have to do something different. But where can I intervene? It might be OK, but it might not. So I need to have somewhere where I can intervene and apply some choice, some deliberate, intentional decisions to do something different. And this is where another risk-related concept comes in. Where can I choose how much risk to take? And the answer is with this term, risk attitude. Risk attitude is defined as a chosen response to risk, driven by perception. Now, that's a, there's a lot behind that definition, and we don't have time to unpack it uh, this afternoon, and I will mention this a little bit more uh, tomorrow afternoon when I give my own proper talk and not giving Ruth's talk. Um, but risk, atti risk attitude is a place where we can choose how much risk to take in a given situation. Because it's a choice, we can choose different things. We may generally, by habit, choose to be cautious, or we might choose to be adventurous, and we're back to Jeff's presentation about our risk types again, and that anchor. But actually, the anchor has a long chain on it, and our boat can float a little bit around that anchor, and sometimes it can float quite a long way around the anchor. So if I find that my natural tendency is to be cautious, but caution takes me to a risk threshold that is not appropriate, maybe I could change my risk attitude. Maybe I could choose something different. So what risk attitude does is it offers us the ability to moderate our risk appetite. A risk appetite just is. It drives us to a particular set of thresholds. We can't intervene because they're all internal. But risk attitude is a choice. So if risk attitude affects the amount of risk we're going to take, then we can use that to intentionally intervene. Are okay, you still with me? Now, there's a lot more we could say about this, but we won't. Uh, let's just look, see what risk attitude looks like. What drives risk attitude? Well, risk attitude is a chosen response to risk influenced by perception. So risk perception, which risk I think is out there, is going to drive my risk attitude. But not just that. There's going to be a whole set of other things, like how much risk there actually is. So I have a situation and some objectives, and there is a, an inherent risk exposure associated with that situation. And I perceive that inherent risk exposure in a particular way through my lenses of risk perception, and that leads me to adopt a particular risk attitude. But there are other influences on risk perception. There's a whole host of them. There's my sort of conscious situation. Do I think this is a risky situation or not? Uh, what do I think the risk-reward balance is, cost-benefit analysis, and so on? There's a whole set of subconscious biases and cognitive heuristics and things that can affect my view, my perception of the amount of uncertainty in a given situation. So lots of subconscious factors. And then there's a third strand, which we call affective factors. That means, how do I feel about things? So if I'm feeling tired, or if I'm feeling angry or frustrated, or if I'm feeling happy and fulfilled, that feeling will influence the amount of risk that I'm prepared to take. And risk appetite, or sorry, risk perception, is driven by a complex sort of a relationship of the things I can see and measure, my previous experience and biases that sit at the back of my head, and my feelings and how I actually arrive on the particular day to make a decision. And we call this the triple strand of influences, three sets of things that affect how we perceive risk. So we've got a whole set of things that drive 
risk perception and through that drive the risk attitude that we adopt. And then out of risk, a risk attitude, we decide what to do. We take actions towards risk, which changes our inherent risk into a residual level of risk, which we then perceive and decide if we need to do anything different. And we have a little control loop, which takes us around here, that says, have I chosen the right attitude? I'll do this. That reduces my risk to this level. Then I look at what the amount of risk left is, and I decide, do I need to do something different? And I choose an attitude which leads to some actions which changes the risk exposure. And so we go round this little risk management loop down here. And we can actually use this chosen risk attitude to influence our risk thresholds, how much risk we're prepared to take in this situation. Now, if we try and put these things together, what have we said so far? What we said is that risk appetite is a tendency. It's internal. It's a tendency to take risk in a given situation. And because it's internal, we have to express it through something external, which is our risk thresholds. The drivers of risk, risk appetite are all internal and hidden, which means that if we just let the risk appetite go where it will, our risk thresholds might be inappropriate. So we need to do something. What we can do is choose a risk attitude, because risk attitude is a choice. It's a choice of how we're going to position ourselves towards risk based on our perception of the situation. So what we could do is to choose a different risk attitude to influence the risk thresholds that come out of our appetite. And that's the end of the complicated bit. So if you were going, oh, I don't understand that, don't worry. Uh, it, it, there's one more complicated slide, and then it gets simpler from there on. Okay? But what I want you to understand is that there's a lot of rigorous thinking that has gone underneath what, what we're talking about here. We're not just making up names and trying to draw pretty pictures. We've really thought about how these things fit together and where they come from, what their inputs and their outputs are. And we've produced a, a consistent model which describes how people think and act when they're faced with risky and uncertain situations. And we're saying there are two central factors. One is risk appetite, that driver, and the other is risk attitude, and that's a choice. And so we call our framework the RAH-RAH model, risk appetite and risk attitude. We had to call it something. Uh, and it has two central factors, risk appetite, which is the tendency to take risk, and risk attitude, which is our chosen response. Both of these influence risk thresholds, but in different ways. Risk appetite is driven, it comes from inside, and it's just determined. Whereas risk attitude is a choice and can be changed. So if we put these together, we might find that we can do something appropriate that will help us achieve our objectives. We can set the right risk thresholds. How do we do that? Well, we could combine these two things together. Here's the picture that I drew up of risk appetite, of where it comes from and where it goes to, the inputs and the outputs. It comes from the situation and the people, and it produces risk thresholds that we can test against our capacity. Can I have that half a bottle of wine? Risk attitude, on the other hand, we've seen is based on perception, and perception comes from the situation that we face, plus all of these subconscious and conscious drivers. And risk attitude results in a risk management loop and the setting of thresholds. Now, if you look carefully at these two diagrams, there are some things in common between the top half and the bottom half. You'll see both of them have the situation and our objectives as inputs, and both of them as outputs which means that with some clever PowerPoint wizardry, we could bring the two together and say, actually, we can combine into a single model risk appetite and risk attitude. Now, that all looks horribly complicated, doesn't it? Could you use that with your board? I don't think so. Could you use it with your project team or even your risk specialists? Uh, maybe not. We need to simplify it, don't we? So let's just have a simple version of this. The simple version is that we face a situation which is risky and which is important, where we need to make some decision on how much risk we're going to take. And so 
What we need is to recognize that we have a tendency, and that tendency is driven by the individuals and the group. But what we're going to do is produce a, a quantitative output, which we call risk thresholds, that actually defines how much risk we're going to take. Within that risky and important situation, we think about how much risk is there, and that leads us to choose a particular position on the risk attitude spectrum, to be cautious or adventurous or neutral or tolerant, wherever it may be on the spectrum. And that choice also influences our thresholds. But the choice of risk attitude, and the thresholds need to be checked against our capacity, that choice of uh, risk attitude also determines the actions that we take which influence the amount of risk that we face, and round we go again. A little bit simpler. Can we make it even simpler? How do we decide what we do here? Let me give you a four-step process that drives us right the way through this model and ends up here with appropriate risk thresholds. Um, here, for, here are my four steps. First of all, we can just see what comes out of us and our group. Let's set unmanaged risk thresholds, driven by who we are, the situation we face, and the corporate risk culture. Let's just see what comes out. So I'm faced with the menu, what do I fancy? And I say, I'm going to have that. I'm going to take a big risk meal in this situation. So we get some kind of gut feel of the board, or the project team, or the sponsor, or me and my wife with our children, or our pension investments. You just get, this is, this is our starting place. That's our first step. A second step would be to say, now, who just made that decision? Where did that come from? Are you feeling a bit adventurous today, my dear? Or boss? I don't call the boss my dear very often, although in my company, the wife is one of the bosses, so that's also a good thing. Um, so where did the individuals come from? What is our corporate culture and how did that influence the decision that we made? And do we need to change our risk thresholds in the light of understanding where they came from? So if they came from a bunch of stakeholders who have just recently made some bad investments and who have lost a lot of money and we're asking them to invest in something new and they're saying no, do we know why? Do we understand that previous experience and that source of bias and those feelings of anger and rejection and uh, frustration? And so we might have to say, well, look, if you do that, then we, need to take, we might need to change the decision because it's driven by a certain set of individual and group drivers. So the first step is, let's see what comes out naturally unmanaged. The second step is to think about where it came from. What did the individuals and the group bring to the party? How did they affect that decision? And then we end up with some modified risk thresholds that reflect that internal driver that comes from who we are. We could stop there, could we? But I don't think we can, because now we have to think about, is that appropriate? Are these risk thresholds going to help achieve my objectives? Are they within our capacity? Or are they too much to bear? Or maybe we're taking too little risk and not uh, stepping outside and really facing the challenge and uh, taking on some opportunities that can give us some benefits. If the risk, risk thresholds are appropriate, that's fine, we can stop there. But if they're not, we might want to choose something different. And we choose something different by changing our risk attitude. By saying, naturally, we're being very cautious because of our previous experience. That's leading us to close off some opportunities for investment for our company or to close out some project opportunities for our portfolio. And actually, that's a wrong decision. We need to do something different here. We need to change our risk attitude to be more adventurous. Then that will ena oops, enable us to modify our risk thresholds in the light of that choice. So now we have an intelligent process. It starts with gut feel, what just comes out of us, then we look at that carefully and say, where did that come from? Then we ask the question, is it okay? And if not, we choose, we actively choose something different, which might involve a countercultural choice. It might involve upsetting some people or going against their natural preferences. But if we want to achieve our objectives, we might have to do that. So our four-step process, we call it unmanaged, let's just see what comes out, 
constrained, thinking about the constraints of the people who made the decision, checking whether that's going to help us, and if not, taking an informed decision to go where we need to go. Okay, you could do that. You might not be able to do the whole rah-rah thing with, you know, these 20 different inputs and all of these different things happening in the middle, but you could do this. And that's, that's the point. Uh, what Ruth and I try to do is you know, understand deeply so you can explain simply. That's, that's our motto. Now, we've done all the thinking. We've come up with this. But we want to just show you in the presentation where it all came from. There is some sort of ground to this. It's not just a consultant's four-step model. It is a consultant's four-step model, but it comes from a lot more. So let me just give you a few final thoughts before I uh, stop and I ask the chairman to invite me to take some questions. Somehow. <laughs> um, why is this important? Risk appetite matters. It matters because it helps us answer these really important questions of how much risk. And by understanding risk appetite and how it's different from the other things, we can focus on the different how much risk questions. Risk appetite is internal, and so we see it through the risk thresholds that we choose, which is our external measurable stand-in or proxy for risk appetites internal. It might give us problems if we don't understand where it comes from, so we need to intervene, and risk attitude gives us that intervention point, that choice point to do something different. We can take the right risks safely, and if we take the right risks safely, then we're more likely to succeed. Well, I hope you found that uh, useful. Um, the challenge for us is to answer the question, how hungry are we? And, you know, we've just had a nice lunch, and we've just had a coffee break, and maybe the answer you is not very. Uh, but the real question is not how hungry are you in terms of the uh, food that we take. Really the question is how hungry are we for risk in our personal lives, in our projects, in our businesses, in our portfolios. We need to know and we need to know what to do about it. And hopefully the RARA model and the ideas behind it will end up giving you a way to access, a way to think about answering these important questions. How hungry am I, and what can I do about it? Um, there is the book, which is coming out in two weeks' time, um, and you can find out about this on Ruth's website uh, or on my website. And, um, oops, and I think there was one more slide, but there isn't. Um, so I hope you found that useful and interesting. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I think I'm pretty much out of time. Am I? Have I? Shall I allow myself two questions? Uh, are there any questions? And remember, the microphone's coming, and you have to wait for the mic. So one across here, please. Andreas. Andreas Lang. Um, you have shown how uh, the situation and the objectives are an input in this risk act. I wonder whether the objectives themselves are not influenced by the risk appetite, whether there should be some looping back to mm. change the objectives. That's very good. Thank you. Yes, I said at the beginning that uh, risk appetite is multi-level. And so we have personal risk appetites, project-level risk appetites, divisional, organizational, and so on. And in the RARA model, the higher level of risk appetite forms part of the situation. So when we launch a project, the project is part of a portfolio, and the portfolio is part of an, an overall corporate strategy. And so the corporate strategy, the, the risk appetite at corporate level, determines how we shape our portfolio. And our portfolio risk appetite and the balance of a risk between the portfolio elements determines how we frame our project and what goes into the project scope. So part of the situation and the constraints of our, um, of our projects will come from the portfolio and the corporate environment. So when we write our business case or our project charter um, or our business plan, um, the project management plan, whatever you call it, we should have in there a statement of acceptable levels of risk. Where do they come from? They come from the project sponsor. How do they know? Well, they get it from the portfolio manager. How does he know? Well, he gets it from the boss, you know, the operations director. And how does she know? She knows because the board have thought about their corporate risk appetite, hopefully. Of course, it doesn't usually happen like that, but we're trying to educate people so that we'll get there eventually. But the answer to the question is that at project or lower level, then the higher level risk appetite shapes the objectives through the situation. A great question. Thank you. 
Maybe one more? Yes, there's one here, please. So how Petra? You okay. Basically, you got nothing. Um, you have everything to win. Sorry. If a startup company, you have nothing to lose and everything to win. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, should, you could say you could gamble everything. Uh, let me give you an example. Peter Bernstein once said he had a client. She was disabled in an accident, got $500,000. And he said, you know, with that amount of money, we couldn't improve the quality of her life. So if we had a defensive investment strategy, we wouldn't improve her life. So we gambled it all and made maybe five or 10 million or lose it all, mm -hmm. in which way it didn't make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. So the same thing you could apply to a startup company. Nothing to lose, a lot to gamble. Yeah. Does it fit in your model? Well, how many startup companies have nothing to lose? I mean, I. You got no assets, you got no nothing, you're uh -huh. fighting against the big guy. Sorry? Yes. You're fighting against the geek, big guy. So, in that respect, sometimes I think, but I, I gladly stand correct, sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult to say, okay, here's our risk appetite mm -hmm. and our tolerance and this or that, because then I think you don't move. Okay, very good question. Uh, I mean, I've started a company, several companies, and other people here will have, and you have something to lose. So first of all, we're putting investments into our companies of finance and of intellectual capital and reputation. And if I screw up, you know, if, I, if my company really does badly, it's me on the line because it's my, it's, it, but my company is me. Startup. So there is investment, there is skin in the game for startups. Um, but I think it's true that we need to recognize the risk appetite will change over time. Why? Because the situation changes. So when we're first starting up, we've got to say, can I bear the very worst that might happen? If I put in, you know, 10 million of my own money and it all doesn't work, is that okay? Can I still live? You know, have I, have I blown absolutely everything and I have to sell the house and I'm begging on the streets? Or, you know, is it okay? And you should never bet more than you can afford to lose. Um, so I think, you know, that might be a part of that sort of conditioning in, in the situation. But hopefully, either you make it or you don't, and then you make another decision. So part of reviewing our strategy should be reviewing our risk appetite, because the situation's changed, and our objectives change. You know, with a startup, we have an objective to make a mark on the market, to get some regular clients, to get some, some profile and some, pu some publicity, to create products and services that people want and need, to actually be seen and be useful. And once we've achieved those, then we have objectives which are to survive and thrive and to grow into something bigger, or maybe not. Um, so we have to recognize as the situation changes, our objectives change, our risk appetite changes. So I think it's a dynamic thing, and we need to, to move with it. Okay, it's a great question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think I've run out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. And Ruth gets the credit. So thank you, Ruth.